Clearly starts a strong possibility. He's got 10 stone 5, I think, on his back. You've got quite a few in there. Yeah. Bristol? Yeah, Bristol's a strong candidate. Bristol's a very strong candidate to run in the Grand National this year. He's got, obviously, 11 stone 8. You know, obviously, Cheltenham, he'll go to Cheltenham first, whether he runs in the Gold Cup or the Ryanair. That will be ground-dependent, but... Um, you know, please God, he can go to... I, I've, I'd love to have a crack with him, especially over the defences the way they are now. I'd love to have a crack with him in the national, you know, and I think this year could be his year for it. You're just chasing the dream, aren't you? Neptune, Colonge and Daryl Jacob racing towards the line! The dream is to be successful. Neptune, Colonge wins the Grand National. It's a hunger, you just, you just want more and more and more of it. When you're here on big days, yeah, do you get nervous, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully it works out, but um, doesn't always. Kelly has like a single parent in a lot of ways because, you know, once the winter comes around, I'm, I'm pretty much gone seven days a week. You know, you go north, south, east, west, and you're going to be driving for 13 hours a day. I think we get about 187 quid a ride. Travelling expenses come out with that, so there's lots of times you wouldn't make money out at all. How close did he come to walking away? One little push and he would have been gone. It is an obsession, it's an addiction. I'm always trying to be two stone under to what my natural body weight wants me to be. Everything literally is building up for that one outcry of joy. They're mad, they're mad to do it. It really is a dangerous sport. I broke my leg, my knee, my shoulder, my arm and my elbow. One of my best friends, Kieran Kelly, got blessing. Just a horse, unfortunately, just took a bad fall and that was it. I want to try and achieve something for us that he could never achieve. And that's why fire still burns. on the near side of tier four just beginning to inch a little closer under Daryl Jacob now alongside Miss Parfois. When you're out there in a race, you know, it's you and the horse against the rest. And Daryl Jacob in the Simon Munier and Isaac Sweat colours. The green jacket jumps it well. When things go right and when a horse jumps for you and travels for you, I think there's a better feeling in the world. And it's Lamy Surge who goes into a narrow lead here under Daryl Jacob. It's the buzz, it's the excitement, it's the adrenaline, it's, you know, everything's just running through your veins. Top notch four, five lengths here in the hands of Daryl Jacob. It is really like an addiction. The more you have, the more you want, and the more you keep fighting for it. And it's back to back wins in the bet, fair chase as Jacob punches the air. Once you've had that first big winner, that first big adrenaline rush, you want it again and again and again. There's nothing like winning, winning's everything. No one ever remembers seconds in a race. It's winning or nothing. We Have a Dream has had a splendid season and the dream becomes a reality at Aintree. We Have a Dream has romped home in the anniversary under a delighted Daryl Jacob for Nicky Henderson, Simon Manier and Isaac Swade. I'm retained by Simon and Isaac and, uh, you know, they're two wonderful people that have come into my life at a very, very important stage in my career. Anthony Bromley, who, again, is, is, is one of the best in the business. He's our racing manager. Um, he buys um, our horses for us. And, you know, I think between the four of us, you know, we just work as a, a very, very good team. They've got 100% confidence in me and what I'm doing. And it works for me because um, I think I thrive on, on trust. Yeah, so I think next week, um, nothing Monday, um, I think we're going to run... Um, Subtle Tuesday with that Ostrak Noir, and then probably... I mean, I've been in the business Gregor. over 30 years, but having worked in the last five years much more closely with the jockey, you do take on board a lot more of what's going on, and they do need an arm around them a lot of the time, and I don't think there's anyone there to do that. Confidence. 
is such a big thing. Even with these top jockeys like Daryl that ride Group One winners, Grade One winners, you just assume they, they, you know, they know they're a good jockey, don't they? Well, they have to be told they're a good jockey more regularly than you realise. I uh, got one ride uh, for Nigel Twiston Davis. My horse today, Maritello, um, I think he's got a chance. You know, he's second favourite in, in, in a four-runner race, and, you know, if, if the favourite underperforms, hopefully we're going to be there to pick up the pieces. And on the far side in the two-tone green is Muratello. Muratello looks for a first win over the larger obstacles today. So heading down towards the final two fences. First flow leads by three lengths. Sitting tight there is Daryl Jacob. Out wider is Albert's back, and then comes Destin de Jean. First float is coming under a little bit of pressure as Muratello starts to close up. First flow, still well clear. Second place, Albert's back. A distant third now is Muratello and racing up towards the line. First flow, an easy winner. In second place will be Albert's back. Then came Muratello, who's finishing very tired, and Destin de Jonc. Look, at I've been a well-beaten third in the end. It's always nice to go and have a winner, isn't it? But, you know, unfortunately, we have a lot more losers than we have winners. You know, you just got to look forward to tomorrow. That's been and done now, and you've got to try to look forward to tomorrow and focus on tomorrow now. We know he's driven by winning, as all jockeys are. How does he handle losing? Uh, no, not great. You could imagine... When you see some of the emotion that he's shown when he's won races, you can imagine what it can be like when he's just got beat. There are days when you go to a Sandown or you go to an Asker and you're a hot favourite and you come second and he's in bits. He wears his heart on his sleeve, certainly. He'd be more emotional than most jockeys, but equally, I think he's good that he lets it out because it's, the, it's those people that are bottling it all up. It's, it's worse, probably. wake up and the first thing I'm thinking about is I'm always looking for the next good horse to ride. Alarm generally goes off between half five, six. Leave the house when, you know, obviously within relation to where I'm going riding out. I spend a couple of hours every morning in riding out or in schooling. From a young age, I was always on the, on the road. And I always allowed myself you know, kind of 15, 20 minutes, just for, in case something was stuck on the road. More times or not, I've always been 15 minutes early. So what do you do for that 15 minutes? I just thought, well, I just put my head down and have a snooze. I couldn't function if I didn't have it now. Some of them I get an awful lot of abuse about, but I mean, I think it's more jealousy that I can sleep and they can't. <laughs> Very, very important riding out. The, the horses have to be trained before they get to a racetrack. I love the connection with horses. I love getting to, to try and get inside horses' minds. I love trying to get the best out of horses, you know, and, and horses are like humans. Every horse is different. You couldn't be excited about getting up in the morning to go and ride the horses that I get to ride on a daily basis. You really shouldn't be doing the job. I like horses to know how to jump the way I'd like them to jump. I always like horses in a lovely rhythm with me. I like them to jump well for me. And then if I can find them in a rhythm and jumping well, then I can start thinking about races with them and putting them into races competitively. You get into the racing mode, then you're 100% you're focused on how you can get the best out of your horses and how you can get the best out of yourself. I'd average about 70,000 miles a year. Some weeks you're traveling all over the country. You're going to, you know, you're going north, south, east, west, and then some days if I've had to drive to Air, or I've had to drive to Kelso or something, you're going to be driving for 13 hours a day. 
Sometimes the days in the cars, they can be very, very long. They can be very, very lonely, especially if you've had a bad day. Yeah, look, we're on the road an awful lot. Um, say if you're up, at, up north for two days, rather than going, spending six hours going up north, coming back down again, and then turn around the next morning, going back up again, Look, it's easier just to, to get a hotel that's near the race course or, you know, one of the race courses and, and pitch in there. To our schedule, um, we only ever really know 24 hours in advance. So declarations are done at 10 o'clock. You'll find out at half 10 where you're racing the next day. So there's no real routine. Your day can change very, very quickly. You know, over the years, unfortunately, the prize money has declined. Uh, so, Jockey, I think it's about 180, 87 quid, I think we get. Um, but obviously, out of that, then, you've obviously got to pay your agent, um, your fuel to get to the races, your physios, your insurances, obviously your tax. But sort of, I think you probably come out with an average of maybe 90-odd quid a ride or something like that. And then you get, I think it's about, 8% or something like that of the, of the winning prize money and then it drops down to about, I think it's about 3.5%, 4% of the, of the place money. You know, I went to Clonmel the other day over in Ireland, drove over, got the ferry over. I got to the gates at Clonmel and the horse was, was declared a non-runner because the ground was too heavy, we couldn't run it. So, I mean, that was, you know, travelling to, to Ireland you know, expenses on the boat, stuff like that, and I never, it was basically a two-day trip that, and, you know, I never made any money ever. They have to be very resilient, and it is a tough ask on a jockey. There's a lot more to it than just driving in a nice car and turning up and looking flash. It does, it, <laughs> there's a lot more to it than that. Married to Kelly, um, I've been with her since pretty much I was 19, since I've come over to England. She's been an absolute rock to me. Probably wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for her. You know, she brings up our two kids, Harry and Darcy, you know, pretty much all winter on her own. She's like a single parent. She comes with racing with the kids every now and again, but, you know, she keeps herself to herself. She's always been that way, and, uh, you know, it's just the way she likes it. I think a lot of wives, um, they've got to be very, very strong mentality to cope with us because we're gone seven days a week during the winter. Um, long days, sometimes we can't eat. So obviously our fuse is a little bit shorter. We get beaten on horses, we're probably bringing it home as well with us. Um, you know, and, and they're there and they, they turn a blind eye to it. It's probably a single man's sport, but equally it is nice to be able to come home to a family and they can make you switch off. I think that's important for him. He can't keep agonising over the ride that day. He's got the rides the next day to worry about. I'd imagine it's quite a difficult job for him. Um, I wouldn't like to be a wife of a jockey, that's for sure. So Royal edging ahead at the last. So Royal from Bray Power's gone and seats David Mullins. It's obviously a high risk sport and, you know, it's, it's, it's one fall you're away and from, from potential disaster, but, um, you know, she's, she's been, been around me for long enough now and I've had a few injuries and she's, you know, she's come to the hospital. She's seen me in some, some bad states before in the past. You don't want to fall, but it's there, that's the danger. And that's why we have three ambulances following us every race. They say you, a jump jockey gets a fall and, you know, one in every 10 or eight or something like that. So it's, you know, it's, again, it's, it's, we're racing at speed. They're mad. They're mad to do it. It really is a dangerous sport. They're taking chances every time they go out, particularly over the jumps. It was a Saturday at Sandown, I got a fall, um, and that done my, done my face, my eye, eye socket, um, and then went to Musper on the Monday. Daryl Jacob, Ben Pauling, looking for a double on the day, leads here with Gwena de Mott. Oh, Gwena de Mott a fall, eh? Gwena de Mott has gone there. One of the horses just went down to the second last and fell over and it was kind of one of the horses that came behind me, kind of done the rest of the damage, yeah. Got the, got the side of my face again. Um, so my looks were probably improved, um, but just stood on the, on the back of my hand or kicked the back of my hand. So it just sort of broke the, the main sort of bones in, in, in the back of your hand. I think it was out for about five weeks. That was bad timing. Um, 
missed out all over Christmas, um, Boxing Day, the Welsh National. There's wonderful races all over the Christmas period, so to miss out on that was a big blow for me. Well, Oxley House were brilliant. Um, I spent a lot of time down here, um, keeping fit in the pool. You know the the, the physios, you know the nutritionists, the gym guys. Um, you, you, they just manage you. And if we didn't have something, you know, like here, you know, you, you're off for five weeks, you're at home. What do you do with yourself? You end up getting heavy. You end up getting fat. Our targets nearly every day is to make weights. There is pressure because if you can't do the weights, you can't obviously ride the horses. For me, it's an obsession. Um, it is an obsession and it's an addiction. I'm, I'm always trying to be sort of two stone under to what my natural body weight wants me to be. The weight is an issue with all the jockeys. Uh, I know Daryl struggles to get those low weights, but all the jockeys struggle to an extent with their weight. You know, with us, we don't really know where we're going from one day to the next, so it's, you can't really plan anything. You know, if I had a couple of pounds to lose, I'd run two or three laps of the race course, and then I could, I could lose a pound and a half, two pounds. If I had to lose any more than that, I'd have to lose uh, in the bath the night before or, or the morning of racing. Obviously, some days, if I've got to lose three, four, five pounds, obviously, you have to miss an evening meal or you've got to miss, miss something the next day. Now, that in itself brings on lots of issues because you, you, know, you aren't eating enough as much as you want. You are sometimes dehydrating yourself a little bit as well, and you're still driving hundreds of miles, perhaps for just one ride, which may get well beat. Um, yeah, with your toxic, or I got down to a certain weight, um, but I need to lose another four. Ready for this? Yeah. Bit of heat? All right. <laughs> How much you got to lose? Four. That's the joys of not having saunas. So yeah, I had no internal really. I had to uh, put a sweatsuit on, get into the car, put the heaters on in the car. Look, it's a couple of pounds you're going to lose. Yeah. You're going to feel really good after this. I <laughs> so I lost two in the car um, in my sweatsuit, and then I went for a run, then I lost another two. So, but look, thankfully it, was, it paid off and, and, the, and the Philly won. This is our chill out area. Hello, man. Hello. He's all right? All right. What's happening? Dara Jacob, the movie, yeah? That'll be boring. <laughs> Come on, boys, play a bit of pool there so you can get yourselves on camera. We're still all good friends and we still look out for each other and we still care about each other. We all know how dangerous the job is. But you'll miss this one now, it's absolute certainty. But like you say, when we go on a track, it's, it's every man for themselves, isn't it? Told ya! <laughs> it's a tough game. Everyone's wanting the same as what you're wanting. You know, there's only can be you know, 10 jockeys can ride them 10 horses in that one race. Unbelievable. There's always people snapping at your heels because at the end of the day, they want, they want to be in the position that you're in, so they're going to try and challenge you first. And he's away, top notch from Baron Elko and racing up the hill, and top notch now showing his class in the hands of Daryl Jacob, an impressive winner of the Silly Isles Novices Chase. You know, you could get in one good horse, and that one good horse will take you you know, to take it to the next stage of your career. Bristol the Mai takes the Silly Isles to Daryl Jacob and Nigel Tristan Davies. You've got to keep the momentum going. Um, so you've got to try and search for the next one, the next one coming through. And that's that's what it's all about. It's been two brilliant last days for Nicky Henderson, Bruce and Raffles and Daryl Jacobs. You're just chasing the dream, aren't you? Number four, Neptune, Neptune Collage. Collage wins the Grand National. A sensational, dramatic Grand National. Daryl Jacob looks to the heavens. And this horse has pulled off a remarkable triumph. Horse racing was never the, the be all for me, really. None of my family had anything to do with, with horses. Um, you know, you see a lot of, you know, jockeys that are coming up now through the ranks. You know, their parents are, are, are trainers or, 
you know, they're doing a lot of pony racing. I never done any of that. So I was literally starting from scratch. Uh, it's Daddy's photo album. Daddy when he was a little boy. It's all the freckles. Wrinkles all over you. Born in uh, born in Donegal. My mum um, her family's from Donegal. Okay. <laughs> My dad, he's from Wexford. He was a deep sea fisherman. His dad's a very, very sporty kind of a man. Even though he was a fisherman, he was a sporty man. He played rugby to a good level when he was younger and you know he loved hurling and football and stuff like that and he wanted all of us kids to be brought up around sport. When I was younger I loved playing rugby. You know rugby was something that I was very very passionate about. Riding um, hunters and inventors and stuff like that was sort of the second preference to me back then when I was younger but you know I thought if I wasn't going to be a rugby player I'd, I'd do something with horses. I went down to a man called Jack Murphy um, when I was in school on the weekends and he had plenty of hunters and show jumpers and stuff like that. And there was a, um, a man called Dar Deacon who was, uh, who was a point to point trainer over in Ireland. Point to pointing is it's an amateur sport. I think point to pointing is a great springboard for any young person that's wanting to be a jump jockey because you're riding over fences. Um, which is the bigger obstacles um, you're riding over there and you've got to learn to try and control your horse. Dar Deacon came up to me one day and he said, I think you'd make a great jockey. And I was like, right. And um, he said, yeah, would you, would you be interested in coming and riding one of my horses? And I was like, not really, no. Because so, generally I didn't, I didn't follow racing. He obviously spoke with Jack. And um, Jack Murphy then said, look, just Go and ride the point pointers. If nothing else, it'll shut him up and he won't keep on to you. I'll never, it's like as if it was yesterday, I'll never forget, went up the gallops and, and I pulled up and I'll never forget Daryl's face. It was, he was gleaming at the top of it, you know, really excited and how did that feel and stuff like that. And I was like, yeah, it was okay. Nothing really burnt inside me. You know, my belly didn't burn thinking, yeah, wow, that was amazing. So it kind of snowballed from there, really. Jack then ended up speaking to my mum and dad, and then it was sort of arranged then, really, that I was going to go to the apprentice centre in Kildare. That's Kieran Kelly. That's one of Daddy's best friends over in Ireland. So I lived with him for about a year, a year and a half, and, you know, whatever Kieran said to me, I just done. I mean, he was, like I say, he, he took me under his wing. A wonderful man to me, and um, I was getting a few rides in Ireland. I was doing okay, you know, not not setting the world alight. Um, I was at a little bit of a crossroads, really, because I was getting I was eighteen at the time then, and I kind of wanted to be doing something with my life. I'll never forget. He said to me, he said, "Right, he said you're on the boat to to England next Sunday." He said, "You've got basically you've got a week to tell your parents," and I was like, "What do you mean?" He says, you're going to England, you're going to Richard Hannan's, and if you don't go, he said, I'm kicking you out of the house. Kieran said to me, he said, when you're over in England, I want you to look out for a job. I rang Kieran up and I said to him, I said, look, Robert and Sal Sally Olner, they're looking for an amateur um, to go point to point in and stuff. And he just said to me, he says, get on the phone now and accept that job. And I said, well, hang on, I haven't even rang him yet. And um, he said, just hang up now, ring him. The two of them, they took me on then, so I started with them, I think, two weeks later. And from there, really, my career has just, it's grown and grown every year. He started out, it was point to pointing with you. Yes, I, I had two seasons with him. <laughs> and? We had our moments. Such as? <laughs> well, like when he broke his collarbone and I had to take him to Salisbury Hospital and he wouldn't do as he was told, but we got through it eventually. You know, the boss and Sally, you know, they were like, you know, obviously they were my bosses, but they were literally like a mother and father to me. They took me under their wing, you know, they looked after me and, and you know, the one thing the boss always did, he, he nurtured my career. He wanted what, what was best for me and not anybody else. Robert had a great influence on him racing and that side of it. And I've always been the old mother in the background. <laughs> what was that like? Oh, I don't really want to know. 
Oh, <laughs> a pantomime. <laughs> After that, I turned professional um, and I went to Paul Keynes in, up in Mockham. And I, look, I had a wonderful, oh, I had a wonderful 10 months with him. I think I had 10 winners from 24, 25 rides, but I just didn't, I didn't feel the same. I didn't, I didn't get the kick out of it, what I was getting at, at the Allners, just for whatever reason, I just, I didn't enjoy it as much. I didn't, the fire wasn't there in my belly. And yeah, I just, I just felt like I was doing it because I was doing it, it was a job really. How close did he come to walking away from racing when he was a young man? Very close. He only wanted one little push and he would have been gone. It took two hours of my time to convince him. I think I was more distraught afterwards than he was. They got me enjoying it again. They started giving me some nice rides and from there the boss got me to ride on the listener. And it's the listener, a big bold jump on the outside, the grey, with Daryl Jacob on board for Robert Olner. Leads from Ruby Walsh on the inside of War of Attrition. Again, it just, like you say, it just went from strength to strength. But it is the listener who races up towards the finish, out clear to win the Lexus, and going towards the finish. The listener wins for Robert Olner and Daryl Jacob. A fantastic front-running performance. That was the horse that put him on the map. He just grew in confidence. He, he never changed from being Daryl, but he grew in confidence. And he just had natural ability. Except one day at Wincanton, he looked round two or three times when he was winning, and then he fell at the last. He didn't look round again for some time. Robert straightened that out a bit. <laughs> the whole way through my career, I've been very, very lucky as in that I've landed on one or two good horses that have just keep propelling me to the next stage of my career. You know, I suppose if you go back to the Boston Sally, it's got to be free gift. Um, very much a standout horse. Um, from there, you know, getting the listener and then picking up the ride on the listener. And then a, a horse that, a wonderful horse to me when I went to, to Nick Williams from there was a horse called Rev de Savola, who I won four or five grade ones on. There's Rev de Savola on the near side, mowing them both down, and Rev de Savola gets up to win for Nick Williams and Daryl Jacob. He kept me going and obviously winning the national on Neptune Colange. Every jockey, when they get into the game, you know, they all want to be a part of that history of, of the Gold Cup, of the Grand National. You know, every jockey wants to ride in the Grand National. Every jockey wants to ride over them um, unique fences. You know, it's a very, very difficult race to win. Neptune Colange, even though he was 33 to one, um, I never felt like as if he was a 33 to one shot. And they're off for the 2012 running of the John Smith's Grand National. For the first lap, I knew it, I'd struggled because of the pace of the race, and I knew from riding a horse at home, I'd never ridden him on a racetrack. But, you know, watching his races previously, I knew he hadn't got the legs that he once had. He jumped the first four fences really well, and I knew then, it's, right, I've got, I've got the horse in a nice rhythm. According to Pete, was over in fifth, followed by Sunny Hill Boy in sixth. Calgary Bay is in seventh. Neptune Colange is in eighth, towards the outside. And all I had in my mind is, don't, don't worry about the race, don't worry about the race. Rhythm, jump, rhythm, jump. The horse himself, to be fair, once we jumped the canal turn, you know, he started jumping, his jumping then got slicker, uh, got better. And he sort of, every fence he sort of past one or two horses out in midair. I really, again, I already really started thinking about that. I was actually in a race when I came around the canal turn and straightened up for sort of the last six fences turn for home. The final fence of the Grand National and on the outside, Sunny Hill Boy, and on the inside of him, that is Steve Astley's the first two. Neptune Colange is battling on in third. The whole way through his career, he was a brave horse. He would literally run through a brick wall for that horse and he tried like no other horse tried that day. Um, and whether he knew where the winning post was or not, I, I hadn't got a clue, but um, he definitely got his nose down at the right time. Sonny Hill boy with Neptune Galange on the outside, bearing down, racing towards the line. Sonny Hill boy and Neptune Galange in a head-bombing, pulsating finish to the 
I knew it was close. I knew it was close. I said to Richie, um, well, um, obviously Richie McLaren was on the other horse. I said, well, what are you thinking? And I was hoping and praying that he was going to say, you've won. He didn't say a lot. That is as close a John Smith Grand National as you will ever see. The photo finish, there might have been only 30 seconds for it to, to be announced. But I promise you now, it felt like a hell of a lot longer than that. It felt like as if it was never going to come. There's Daryl Jacob. Has he won his Grand National? Has he come so agonisingly close? Place. First number four, Neptune Collage wins the Grand National. And then when he announced that, you know, the number, I was just, yeah, I couldn't contain myself. It was, it was an unbelievable moment in my career, yeah. People ask me all the time, how did you feel and stuff like that, and it's very, very difficult to, to say how you were feeling because there's adrenaline, there's emotions, there's, you know, the success, the, you know, there's everything literally is building up for that one outcry of, of joy there. Any jockey to, can say that they, they, they won a Grand National is, is probably the, the pinnacle of their, their career, isn't it? A lot of people will, you know, when you speak to them about like what you do and as a profession and say, oh, I'm a jockey, you know, one of the first questions they'll ask you, have you ever ridden in the Grand National? And you can say, yeah, I have actually. And, you know, I've been lucky enough to win the Grand National. It all of a sudden, it's the Grand National. It catches the public's imagination. Everybody was cheering him. We were all very proud of him and yes. I think we had a, a drink or two <laughs> on that. I've been very, very lucky the whole way through my career. I've, I've had wonderful people look after me. I've had wonderful people that have kept me grounded through everything. Um, and I've had a fair share, a lot of disappointments along the way as well. So I know you can never get too high up in this sport because it's got a funny way of bringing you back down to, to earth again. It's our Olympics, it's, uh, it's everyone's dream to ride winners around here. Um, it's a very, very special place. Um, and there's a lot of history involved here in riding winners around here. You know, all the, all the top horses, all the top jockeys, all the top trainers, they've all, all been here, road winners around here. Like I say, it's, it's a very, very unique place. Zarkander now has taken the lead for Daryl Jacob, but over the final flight, Zarkander just had the lead to run away towards the near side, and accompanied over on the far side, trying to stay on. They've got 150 yards to go, and up to the line, it is Zarkander who is going to win the triumph hurdle. First winner was um, a horse called uh, Zakanda uh, for Paul Nichols in the Triumph, and then I won on Lac Pantan as well. They've got a half furlong to go. Lac Fontana and Daryl Jacob on the near side, just a nose in front. It's going to be tight. Lac Fontana wins the county. It was a great moment, great joy. Always, no matter what, whether it's a grade one or whether it's a handicap, it's always very, very special to ride a winner around here at the Chatland Festival. Had that, um, was in cloud nine, and all of a sudden I've gone from pure joy to, to disbelief, I suppose, in, in a half an hour. Well, the runner's approaching the start for the Albert Bartlett novices hurdle, but we have some news of an incident involving Port Mellon and Daryl Jacob in front of us. Here's what happened, and the horse hanging and crashing through a set of running rails um, just cantered down to the start on Port Mellon. Um, he veered, went off trail, and uh, he went into a camera. And Daryl Jacob taking a really nasty fall here. Broke my leg, my knee, my elbow, and my shoulder. I didn't feel any pain at the start because all I, all I was thinking of, I've, I had good rides. But to be honest with you, I thought it was all right. I thought, you know, I was trying to get up on my feet and I was trying to get up, I thought, you know, give it a rest for half an hour and I'd re be ready to go in the second last race again. Um, obviously the paramedics, they seen a little bit different side to me, they, they, they wouldn't let me get up. 
my elbow was completely shattered. So they put a lot of wires in my elbow just to, so I can get some sort of movement back in it again because it was obviously in a fairly messy old state. You hit the, the wires, the wires hit the nerves, the nerves and, you know, the bones and everything. So, you know, and it gets a little bit of filling, a bit of swelling there at times. Once you're lying in that bed and you're thinking, you're, you're counting down, how fast can I get back? That's the first thing that you're thinking about, right, I need, you know, I want to get back ASAP. How do I get back ASAP? The longer you're out, you know, the, the more guys are going to, you know, get on your horses and ride winners in your horses. And it's very, very difficult when someone else wins on them. It's, it's very, very difficult to get back on them horses. So, you know, the, the way you narrow it down is if you get back as soon as you can, it gives less guys chances to get on your horses, if that makes sense. And then obviously that's Kieran Kelly. Myself and Kieran Kelly used to obviously ride out. We used to live with each other an awful lot. Maybe my career mightn't have started off if it wasn't for him. So, um, you know, you could talk all day and all night about him. He's just a wonderful guy, yeah? Just a horse, unfortunately, just took a bad fall and that was it. Fortunately, he just fell and God bless him, that was it. Taught me everything, really. Well, I've got a picture in my car, in my room. I've got quite a lot of them, yeah. Do you ever, when you're driving up and down the motorways, do you ever, do you ever talk to him? Yeah, quite a lot, yeah. <laughs> what do you like to tell him? Well, I just, obviously, the usual, see how he's getting on. I still believe he's, he's up there, he's looking down at me. And he's wanting every bit of success for the two of us. When in your career have you thought of him and perhaps thought... Every this, day. This achievement is for you. Every day. You won the Grand National in 2012. Fabulous achievement. How much did you think of him then? That was for him. <laughs> Sorry. You know, when I lived with him and stuff like that, you know, we used to watch the National and he always said to me, that's one race, that's one race I want to win. And um, it was just, it was just so happened that it was, you know, thankfully I won it and, and I just thought I'd, I'd share that moment with him really. Whenever he died, I kind of wanted to do something that he obviously never could achieve. And that's why I suppose the fire still burns. Right, team? Kev's yeah. already, look, he's got his club out and everything. He's ready to swing it, baby. <laughs> oh, he's nailed it. <laughs> That's a very good thing that we do um, every year himself, Carver Kev, Kev um, and Dan. We play over Castacoon, the Manor House, beautiful golf course, lovely scenery over there, and it's just kind of a sort of a chill chill out before you kind of get really into the stress and the, uh, you know, of, of, of Cheltenham Festival, really. Peach! I always want to go out there and I always want to beat the boys, but you not know, just beat them, but just beat them ugly. Dan Tuck, who's obviously, um, he's a pro golfer and he also does the cooperative over at uh, Castle Coombe and Carpet Kev, obviously he's a, he's a carpet fitter and he's, uh, you know, me and him have been very good friends for God knows how long now, must be 10, 11 years. Well, he's not going to get this, is he? Well. No chance. My right edge. Oh, it is. Oh! In robbery. Barrel three Thanks. Up. Appreciate that. Coronavirus, mate. <laughs> Coronavirus, I think, touching you. Two very, very good guys and totally different profession to what I do. And, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's nice just to get away from the bubble of horse racing. Um, I've known Dad for, I don't know, 15 years and I expect. Uh, we met on a golf course. Didn't stop moaning. Oh, no, oh my Kev. God. <laughs> All right! 
you know, they take the piss out of me and, and I take the piss out of them. And it's, like you say, it's just, you know, three guys going out there and, and hitting the ball and having a bit of fun. Oh, that's fat. <laughs> that's fat. Hit the road, hit the road. Oh, oh. You didn't get... How fat was that? I played really well. Um, you know, my putting was good. Um, yeah, no, I hit some really nice shots there. So, uh, you know, um, I love my golf. I mean, if I could play golf seven days a week, I would. Met Daryl back in 2011, uh, funnily enough, golfing. And I think since then, I think he's only had one Cheltenham winner. He did win a Grand National. So I, I think you could probably say that I've been uh, pretty unlucky on him. <laughs> oh, that is class. The last week before Cheltenham, you know, I'm literally thinking about Cheltenham Festival every night, every day, every minute. Every year, the whole year is, is sort of geared up towards the Cheltenham Festival. Every jockey wants to be go there injury free, you know, full of confidence. The horses coming through their trials really, really well. You ask any jockey, they would, at the start of the week, they take any winner, they take one winner. It could be the difference between a good season and a bad season. It's been a yeah, hit the crossbar sort of festival for Daryl and the Green Colours. The first year he rode for Simon Isaac in the triumph hurdle of that year, Daryl had been riding top notch because he'd been winning on top notch at other tracks. And going over the last, Daryl thought he got it won on top notch and just caught him was Peace and Co and Barry Garrity. Top notch will have the lead over the final flight. His stable mate to the near side is Peace and Co with a high head carriage, but he's been delivered to perfection by Barry Garrity. He goes on by a neck, six wins in the triumph, and Nicky Anderson, it was Peace and Co who beat top notch. There was a number of seconds still to, more to come, and we have hit the crossbar for Daryl in quite a number of years now. It's a very important day for the horse and, and for us as well and uh, you know we need to find out whether we genuinely think he's a champion hurdle horse or not. He's had a good season so far and uh, this is kind of one of the roads that lead to the champion hurdles. I think if he's got to go to Cheltenham and we think he's got a really good chance, you'd like to think he's, he's good enough to win this race today. Under orders! He's about to turn and face the starting team. They're off. El Dorado Allen, John Joe Neal Jr. is in yellow and black on the grey, and he would be about a neck ahead of favourites. Odds on chance, call me Lord. Call me Lord looks to have very narrowly taken third now from El Dorado Allen in the yellow and black with very little between them. Now it is Kelder Stan and Call Me Lord who move on towards together. And Kelder Stan is just in front of Call Me Lord as they take the final obstacle. And as they run up to the line, Kelder Stan and Harry Cobden leading by two. And they stay in front to win. They turn over Call Me Lord. I thought I'd come there and I'd have a winner, um, you know, and that you know the horse to go to Cheltenham with, with a real life chance. He's got beaten, so that's obviously dented his his sort of CV going into the Cheltenham Festival. So it's very very disappointing when these horses get beaten. But you know, unfortunately, it's it's part and parcel of the game. We got to dust ourselves down. We got to go again. And we were hot favourite, but um, beaten fair and square. We're now scratching around trying to try and find chances that we've got a squeak of, you know, Bristol to May Gold Cup. Um, Kilda Sight and Handicaps, you know, uh, Constitista in the Mayor's Novice. You, you're looking, you, you know, we've got some squeaks, but it's not looking as, as rosy as it was prior to Christmas. Now to some sad news reaching us this morning. The Cheltenham Gold Cup winning trainer, Robert Olner, has died at the age of 76. In a 20 year career, he also enjoyed success. Fortunately, it's been a very tough week for a lot of people in racing, really. Um, you know, obviously the boss he passed away um, during the week, but you know, unfortunately, he just um, he lost his uh, the fight that he had with with his infections. Um, it was a very tough 24 hours for me, but um, you know, I know the boss will never ever be forgotten. Um, you know, and I'll still talk to him on a daily basis, the same way as I do Ken Kelly.
It's always tough losing someone that you love. It's um, it's always tough. The boss has been been like a father figure to me ever since I came over to Ireland. Um, he's someone I spoke to regularly, you know, and I had a lot of I had a lot of love from. Do have a lot of love from, and he was always there to point me in in, in the right direction. because he, he, he is tight, like. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've got your money, Brian, you see? You never want to get injured um, coming up to Cheltenham, that's for sure. Um, unfortunately, it happens, because jockeys were going to get falls, horses are going to fall. But, yeah, leading up to Cheltenham, you never, ever want to get a fall. National Hunt Novices Hurdle here at Doncaster at the top of the home straight and Carlo Farmer is the first to bound on with the Macon Lugnatic towards the inside. And now they're about to turn into the home straight, the Macon Lugnatic still leading the way to Carlo Farmer. Igor can find no more, they're well clear of the others as they race down towards the last. The Macon Lugnatic on the far side of Severano, the Macon Lugnatic and Severano clear of Carlo Farmer and Igor towards the dawn has fallen at the last with Daryl Jacob on the ground. The whole race just didn't work out for him, if I'm being honest with you. Um, and then he's just gone down to the last and he's just met the last on a, on a wrong stride and he ended up just turning over with me. Thankfully he got up and he walked away, but he just gave him, himself and myself a, a sort of a worse fall than what we, we would have liked. I hurt my elbow hurt my shoulder, um, a good a good bit of bruising. Yeah, look, it just um, took a tired fall at the last and Tosh rolled over on top of me and uh, just started giving me a bit of a kicking. The joys. <laughs> it's very, very sore, but you see, you keep going, innit? you? You've got to keep going. Another ride, I've got him riding in another hour's time, so I've got to get prepared for that now, haven't I? So you're actually going to ride in the, in the last race? Yeah. Shouldn't you be resting or something? No. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're meant to do, aren't we? Jockeys, that's what we're meant to do. We're meant to keep riding. So I feel fine, I feel all right to ride. So you know, there's, no point in, uh, there's no point in crying off, is there? It's part and parcel of the game. We get falls, we've got we to gotta get up and, and try to dust ourselves down. I mean, as long as, you know, as long as there's no bones broken or anything like that, you know, we're hopefully we're ready to go again. In some cases, it wasn't ideal. I had a couple of bad falls. Um, some of the horses didn't run up to to what we thought they were going to run up to because it was very soft ground. So it probably wasn't the ideal scenario coming to Cheltenham. But um, look, it's part and parcel, you've got to get on, you've got to do it, haven't you? Cheltenham, you go to Aintree, Sandown, all them big um, meetings where there's where there's big crowds and you know and you're coming down to shoot at Cheltenham, whatever, and you know people are shouting your name, great ride, great this, and you know you feed off that. Kelly, how is he today? Uh, yeah, no, he's fine actually. To be fair, he's um, he doesn't really get worked up about it. It's just another day at the races, really, and obviously there's more pressure, but. He enjoys it and hopefully it'll, it'll work out. <laughs> I can't describe how difficult it is to ride a winner at the Channel Festival. It's tough, it's every man for himself. I don't normally get nervous, but obviously when you're here on big days, yeah, do get nervous, yeah. <laughs> Are you confident for him today? Uh, I am, yeah, you have to be, I suppose, don't you really? And hopefully it works out, but 
um, doesn't always. Yes, you want to do the best by everyone involved in it, but you put too much pressure on it and it'll end up clouding your judgment. You forget that he's never ridden a winner in the double green at Cheltenham Festival. He's ridden winners at Cheltenham and other meetings for us and, and Group 1 wins all over the place, but it hasn't done it at Cheltenham. And coming forward towards the tape. They're off. A race away then, uh, down to the first of these 20 fences, Vindication, Activia. You know, I got a good start. I jumped well for the first four or five fences, which is very, very important. In a big handicap like that, if you miss one fence, or if you're slow at one fence, that could be a race over. For pars, vintage cards, either side of Vindication. The conditionals behind those in fourth place, and then killed his sat. I knew in my head what I wanted to do with the horse, and what I had to do with the horse to give him the best possible chance of, of winning the race. Thepage and Vintage Clouds together. Between them is Vindication. Killed his start in the conditional, close up four and five. They're running on towards the home turn. Sepage leading to Vindication in second. Killed his start in third. From my point of view, I've no regrets. We left everything out there. Killed us out on the left, Daryl Jacob, as they come to the second last. The conditional, an error in fourth position. Moving towards the last now. Vindication with the nose band of Sepage. Killed us out. Behind those, the conditional, a big jump against the running rail. Behind those, Disco Rama. Up the hill they come. The conditional, Brandon Powell now. Killed us out. Big River staying on. Vindication is still there. Then Disco Rama, but it's the conditional of Brandon Powell. Killed us out in second position. Closing the conditional has jumped. Got the line in front. No one ever remembers the seconds, do they? They only remember the winners, and at the end of the day, you could give give the horse a bad ride and win. You know, you're still a winner. You give the horse the best ride in the world, you finish second. It doesn't really count, does it? I think he thought he got the race won at one stage. He thought he got it covered. Um, and just got agonised in our agonisingly beat. I could imagine him not sleeping that well that night, and he shouldn't be like that, because he did everything right, and the horse ran a blinder. But there we are, it was a great run, but no cigar. I was really looking forward to her. She was one of my strongest rides of the week. And, uh, you know, in theory, I suppose she was probably my last realistic chance of riding a winner. You know, she was my last bullet to fire at her. I think it's not just that week. I think, I think it's five years of Cheltenham Festivals is putting the pressure on it. We don't see that, but I think he does. for the Dalesford Mayor's Novice Hurdle Grade 2. The horse just in front of me sort of missed the break, so, you know, for the first two furlongs, I was probably a little bit further back than what I want to be. And then on the inside is Midnight's Gift. After Midnight's Gift, last year's runner-up, Concertista. Concertista's been followed by Vienna Court. And there was a little bit of carnage held in front of me, actually, which kind of helped me because they bumped into each other and then another little gap opened up, and my mare was very good. She just went straight into that gap. She came back on the bridle, and then it was just a case of, of holding her together for as, uh, as long as I could, really. They've still got a full and a half to go, and it's Dolcita who springs the lead in the hands of Robbie Bauer. Over on the far side is Concertista, now in second. I gave her a squeeze going down to the last, and she's, she's really fire putting up the home straight. And Concertista has picked it up the best, coming down towards the final flight. Concertista lands in front for Daryl Jacob. In second, Dolcita. In third over, that was Cole Reevy. And they've got another half hour long to go. She may well have been runner-up last year, but she's emphatically going to win the 2020 renewal. It is Concertista. I'm so proud, I'm so happy just to... To, to win that race, and, and I promise you, just that means the world to me. Concertista has won about as impressively as any horse this entire week. Broad grin from Daryl Jacob in the colours of his retaining owners, Simon Munier and Isaac Sweat.
you know, I've had some wonderful winners for them. For the last four and a half years, I've been working for them. But to have a, a Cheltenham Festival winner for them in their colours, I was really proud, really, really proud. The boss is looking down on me today, so, you know, this is one for the boss, and, uh, you know, unfortunately he's passed away, but, you know, it was nice to, to get one. It means a lot. You know, obviously getting my first festival winner for Simon and Isaac and Anthony and, you know, with the boss passing away, it's been, it's been a tough sort of couple of months, so it's, it's, it's fantastic now. I'm, I'm over the moon. It just meant everything. It was the fulfilment of a long period. It wasn't like a monkey off his back, but in his mind it was. We've got total faith in the jockey, but just to have done it on the big stage for us was just great for him, you know? Yeah, these, um, obviously, the kids done it for me on Thursday. Um, I got one to come in the door. Um, they had a little present for me, obviously, when Concertista won. That win for me will be right up there. Once I, I do retire, whenever the time may come, you know, I think I'll look back on it with a lot of satisfaction. Down four fours. Uh, now we have uh, Emily Shepherd on Sweepy. Whenever I do decide to retire, obviously I'm going to have a lot more time with the family. So obviously from that point of view, I think it's going to be very, very exciting. You know, I can go and watch, you know, Harry play football games on a Saturday and playing rugby. And I can see Darcy, you know, playing on her ponies or whatever career path she decides to go down on and, and spend a lot more time with Kelly. One, two, three, go! <laughs> <laughs> Another point, I suppose, it's, it's quite scary because then you've got to go and try and find a job, I suppose, because at the moment, you know, riding horses, I don't feel like it's a job. I feel like it's a... It's a pastime, it's a, it's a love, it's, you know, you couldn't think of any better way to go and enjoy your day. Yeah! Got two today. Yeah! That's the class That's that you point. did, and you came third. that adrenaline run through your veins, the excitement and nerves, everything that runs through you when you're riding horse, I think it's going to be very, very difficult to replace. Fire still burns to, to ride good horses, to, to ride big winners, to, to achieve the targets that I've set myself. If you want something badly enough, you know, you'll keep fighting until you achieve it, and that's what I want to do. I want to keep going, keep going and keep going. If I can get out of the game and touch wood in, in one piece and, and achieve everything that I want to achieve, there can be no regrets then, can there?